welcome to the fifth episode of the Solo Dungeon Crawler Solo Roleplay Podcast. I'm Tom, and I'll be talking you through my adventures in solo tabletop roleplaying games, particularly the original 1974 version of Dungeons and Dragons. But from time to time, I will also drop in various other bits and pieces all dependent on what interests me at the time. Before I get into this episode, I'd just like to offer thanks to all those who have been following along with this podcast and my wider channel so far. I know my upload rate is pretty low, but nevertheless, I'm always working on stuff in the background It just sometimes takes me a while to pull everything I need for an episode together and make it reasonably presentable. So without further ado, let's get into episode number five. Returning to my Castle of the Quest campaign, which is my current OD&D solo campaign, as per the time of this session report, it is now the 30th of the 5th, 2024. My adventuring party, the Questing Knights, are still nine in total, plus a hired thief named Carson. They also have five heavy foot dwarves in their employ, In present tense, I will relay the events as they unfold. The questing knights want to find somewhere safe to hide their treasure before they make another delve into the dungeon maze below the castle of the quest. They decide to travel two miles out of town along the river to the edge of the Great Plain, which is coordinates G7 on my wilderness map bury the treasure near the construction site for their stronghold which they have named the castle of abundance and draw up a map to the treasure's location the party also want the treasure to be secured in an iron chest so they decide to visit a smith to have one built it takes 20 days for the woodworker to craft the chest and it costs 18 gold pieces. This calculation is based on my own supplemental rules for calculating the cost of a craftsman, and they work as follows. The cost of any item crafted that is not otherwise detailed is calculated at one gold piece per month of time required with added multipliers for materials, size and scope. The base cost and amount of time required is influenced by three factors. The first factor is the detail, intricacy and personalization of the item to be crafted. The second factor is the item's complexity and resource availability. And finally, the third factor is the item's mechanical complexity. Each of these factors has a rating of either basic or complex. I've drafted a table that displays all the possible combinations of basic and complex ratings across these three factors, and the base time required, as well as the cost, varies. At the very top of the table, if all three factors are rated basic, then the base time required is just one day and the base cost a gold piece. At the very bottom of the table, if all three factors are rated complex, then the base time required is 90 days and the base cost is three gold pieces. Once the basic amount of time required and the cost has been established, These are multiplied by 1 if the item is easily portable, 
to if the item is not easily portable but can fit in a room and six if the item is structural or building sized. There is also a cost multiplier for materials, clay, feather, bone, plant, pitch or resin, etc. dictates a times two multiplier, wood times three, leather times four, glass times five, paper times six, shell times seven, textiles times eight, metal times nine, and finally gemstones or precious metals invoke a times 10 multiplier. Payment and time required for a large iron chest would be one gold piece multiplied by two for size and scope, which is two gold piece, and multiplied by a further nine for the iron required, which is 18 gold pieces. The chest will take 20 days to complete, Base time required, further multiplied for size and scope. On the 19th of June, the party transport the chest of treasure by wagon to the desired location and bury it. My rules for hiding treasure work as follows. Excess treasure can be hidden or buried to reduce encumbrance. A map drawn up which leads to its location. It will typically take one full day to hide or retrieve the hoard plus the travel time required to whichever location it has been placed. Buried treasure should be noted on the wilderness map key. When an attempt is made to retrieve the treasure there is always a chance that it has been stolen. The likelihood based on the specific precautions that have been taken Ilara casts a wizard lock spell on the chest to prevent it being easily opened and after the party buries it, she casts phantasmal forces to create an illusion of a nasty, muddy depression that would best be avoided by most intelligent travellers. This whole activity takes a full day to carry out. The following day, before the party make another descent into the maze, they need to purchase iron rations. However, as they neglected to keep any coins on them, they only have a piece of jewellery worth 8,000 gold pieces, which they kept back in case it was ever needed. It's a bit excessive to break into this by selling it for coins, so instead the party decide to sell some things. The party need 20 gold pieces to buy an additional 9 days of iron rations. Brie Landell and Drago sell their shields for 16 gold pieces total so they can more readily use their crossbows. Ilara sells two of her daggers for a further 4 gold pieces and 8 silver pieces. I have some pretty structured rules for buying and selling. If a character wishes to sell unwanted items, then a suitable merchant or trader must be sought because any other type of worker, be it a blacksmith, grocer, carpenter or what have you, would usually only sell wares brought about by their own hands. Once a trader has been found, they would buy at 80% of the original purchase price to maximise their potential profit without risking condemnation for usurious behaviour. Negotiating these standard buying and selling prices is condemned. If a character wishes to purchase something supplied in multiples at a quantity that is different than the stated amount, for example, two days of iron rations instead of seven, then I simply divide the price by its supplied quantity multiply it by the quantity desired and round to the nearest gold piece. Two days of iron rations would therefore cost five gold pieces. The party also need a quart of wine, each for the delve, enough for their retainers as well, and iron rations for the retainers. They are forced to sell the piece of jewellery for 6,400 gold pieces 
and buy the things they need, leaving them 6,135 gold pieces. They use the remaining coins to buy another piece of jewellery, a heavy platinum ring inlaid with gems for 6,000 gold pieces. They are now ready for the delve. Now, I'm not going to go into detailed specifics regarding the delve, as I'm sure by now you know how it works. I use the random dungeon generator written by Gary Gygax in Strategic Review, issue one, which was later reproduced and expanded in the appendices of the AD&D Dungeon Master's Guide of 1979. I've customised mine to include roles for random noises, air, odour and dressing, just to add some interest. And I will publish an up-to-date PDF one day for my method. I do generate the dungeon as I go along, excluding of course areas I have already previously rolled up. I also use very strict timekeeping methods as this is extremely important when playing solo as it creates the procedure that allows an emergent story to arise. In regards to random noises, these are split into various categories which includes bestial, alarming, mechanical, ambiguous and ambient. All these sounds are either receding, die 1 to 2, approaching, die 3 to 4, or distant, die 5 to 6. Distant sounds do not affect any game mechanics. After determining the direction of any non-distant sound at random, if the party then decide to move in the direction of the sound, there will be several possible effects depending on the category of the sound. Firstly, all categories of sound will have the effect of instilling fear into retainers who will therefore be subject to a morale check to determine how they react to the sound. Bestial sounds affect the next wandering monster check. A monster will more easily appear on a roll of 5 or 6 instead of a 6 and the type of monster will be dependent on the sound. Any wandering monster appearing from the same direction that a sound originates cannot surprise the party. If a bestial sound originates behind a door or in an unmapped chamber, then I treat it as a monster being present and a sound detected for the unmapped space. Mechanical sounds influence the handling of various traps. Dwarves will gain a plus one bonus to their two in six chance of detecting a non-magical trap on the turn following a move in the direction of the mechanical sound. And any thief attempting to remove a trap discovered in this next turn will gain a 10% bonus to their chance of success. Ambient sounds help characters searching for a secret door, trap door passage, etc. Any character performing such a task on the turn following a move in the direction of the sound will gain a plus one bonus to their chance. Alarms can attract a patrol of intelligent monsters. A wandering monster check should be rolled immediately with a five in six chance of something appearing. Ambiguous sounds are ambiguous, of course. They are left to the discretion of the solo player to decide how this sound may affect the game. This leaves opportunities open to use oracles to ask questions about the sound and influence the story in that way. So here are the highlights of the delve. On this delve, Within less than 20 minutes of expedition, the sound of screaming can be heard coming from the direction the party are heading. The dwarven thief Carson, hired by Brielandell, fails their morale check and as a result feels far too uneasy to advance further in the direction of the sound. The dwarven heavyfoot 
are also shaken and desert the mission altogether, leaving the party to fend for themselves. Brie Landell manages to calm the shaken thief, and so they continue. About 40 minutes into the delve, the sound of squealing can be heard coming from the direction the party are heading. This time, Carson passes their morale check, and so bravely agrees to keep going. About an hour in, the sound of footsteps can be heard receding ahead. Carson is half-hearted about moving in that direction, and so the party are reduced to half speed. With the second hour of the delve fast approaching, the party are making their way north up a passage when suddenly they see a carrion crawler approaching them. The creature is crawling across the ceiling directly in front of them. The party will try to evade the monster and if the creature pursues them, then they will attempt to distract the creature with a day's worth of iron rations. Luckily, the party win the initiative roll and flee up a connecting northeast passage. The dice determine the monster will pursue them. The party pass by a pile of rags scattered in the connecting passage and they hear disembodied footsteps running alongside them. A mystery they have no time to solve. The party take a sharp right into an intersecting passage. This time, the carrion crawler gives up the chase. Moments after the party turn down the side passage, they come nose to nose with four bugbears, who have managed to sneak up on the party from both sides. And as the party did not have a chance to rest from their pursuit by the carrion crawler, they will suffer penalties to their abilities. Minus one to attack rolls, minus one to AC, and minus one to morale dice. The party will attempt to bribe the monsters with the platinum ring they carry to influence the monster's reaction roll and then cast sleep and retrieve the ring back again. A cunning plan. The bugbears willingly accept the bribe. There is a two in six chance the party can surprise the monsters with the sleep spell. They do. All the bugbears are put to sleep and the ring retrieved. These examples are great for showcasing how avoiding monsters can work in od and Combat should not always be the way to resolve an encounter. In fact, it is often better to avoid monsters unless, of course, they are guarding a fancy hoard of treasure. On the following turn, as the party are resting, a gelatinous cube comes slithering and sliding down a narrow passage ahead. This gelatinous cube contains a piece of chain mail, a piece of plate mail, a helmet, various shields, hundreds of iron spikes, and a few silver crosses, but nothing of particularly serious value. To calculate what a gelatinous cube has inside it, I devised my own random tables. Gelatinous cubes will contain one to three pieces of chainmail armor, one or two pieces of plate mail armor, one to ten helmets, one to ten shields, sixty to one thousand two hundred spikes, and one to four silver crosses. There is also a 1 in 6 chance the gelatinous cube will be housing some form of metal treasure. To handle this, I have produced a percentile table, which includes everything between copper pieces and magical talismans. To 
create this, I went through everything metal listed in the Odeon D books. And I went through some pretty painstaking scrutiny to ensure that probabilities of the less mundane items, such as the magical stuff, reflected the probabilities of them occurring as random treasure. I try to do this with anything supplemental I add to my game, as I think it's pretty important to keep balance. You could argue that I'm cheating otherwise. As the party have had no luck in regards to this particular gelatinous cube, they attempt to flee back up the corridor and take a northeast side passage. They win the initiative, flee back up the corridor and take the first right. The cube pursues. They continue running up the passage where they previously passed a trap. Hilda Stoneheft, the party's trusty dwarf, has a two in six chance of noticing it. She is successful. This is an example of another simple supplemental rule I introduced for solo ODD. When underground, dwarves can detect slanting passages traps, shifting walls and new construction about one third of the time, two in six. This is basically lifted from either Holmes Basic or Basic Expert d and I'm not entirely sure off the top of my head which. The party decide to remain still and use burning oil to deter the gelatinous cube from pursuit. Brielandel Golden Dawn, the elf of the party, swiftly pours her flask of oil on the ground as they flee, and then she lights and drops a torch. The gelatin's cube is deterred from giving chase any further, and so retreats back to whence it came. So here was a further example of avoiding monsters, OD&D Volume 3 does provide some extensive rules on evasion in the underworld. Although these rules aren't set out as well as could be. Interestingly, if you read the earlier typewritten draft of OD&D, it can actually help with interpretation of the rules in the final version. In more or less Gygax's words, mingled with some of my own words, where I have extrapolated or attempted to fill in the blanks to ensure consistency with solo play. This is how I handle it. There is no chance for avoiding if the monster has surprised the adventurers and is within 20 feet unless the monster itself has been surprised. If the monster has surprised the adventurers and is not within 20 feet, then there is a 25% chance that any character will drop some item. If they do, roll for the possibilities, remembering that only these items held could be so dropped, such as a lantern with burning oil, an edible item such as rations or treasure. Dropped items will have a chance of distracting monsters from pursuit, i.e. Edible items have a 10% chance of distracting intelligent monsters, a 50% chance for semi-intelligent, and a 90% chance for non-intelligent. Treasure works in reverse. 90% chance of distracting an intelligent monster, 50% for semi-intelligent, and 10% for non-intelligent. If there was no surprise, then initiative determines who gets to move first, if the party lose the initiative check, they can begin their retreat at the half portion of the monster's move. If initiative is tied, then movement is simultaneous. Both sides make one half of the move, checking for melee contact. If there is none, then the balance of movement is completed. All parties can move up to double their normal movement rate, which is four times their encounter speed. So a light foot can move 480 feet, heavy foot 360 feet, and armored foot 240 feet. In order to move faster, characters may elect to discard items, such as treasure, weapons, shields, etc. 
in order to light an encumbrance. Burning oil will deter any monster who is not impervious to fire from continuing pursuit. And when a corner is turned or a door passed through or stairs up or down taken, the monster or monsters will only continue to follow if a one or a two is rolled on a six sided die. If a secret door is passed through, the monster or monsters will follow only on a roll of one. The party can also elect to drop edible items, treasure or burning oil to distract the monster from pursuit, as I've already discussed, and two turns of rest must be taken after the pursuit ends. The monster guards where the pursuit ends and should be added to the map key along with any items dropped. Hilda notices a pedestal with an offertory box on top situated in an alcove of a five foot wide passage wall. Instead of attempting to remove it, the party want to avoid it instead. But although Hilda knows it is there, she does not know the exact nature of its workings. Maud the Magnificent has the highest intelligence score he has a 4 in 6 chance of being able to solve the puzzle. He is confident that the offertory box required no less than a gold piece to satisfy whatever magical trap is at work. However, aside from 8 silver pieces, the party are only carrying the platinum ring, which is worth 8,000 gold pieces. Now that the oil has stopped burning in the passage following their evasion of the gelatinous cube the party decide to abandon the direction ahead of the offertory box you may be wondering why i did not use the rolling against intelligence method to determine whether Maud understood the working of the trap read the article on my blog at solodungeoncrawler.blogspot.com which explains why rolling against ability scores in OD&D is unbalanced. The article is entitled, you can probably guess, OD&D Ability Checks and Why Rolling Under is Unbalanced. As the party approach a chamber they encounter six giant rats, preventing access to a modest pile of gold, silver and jewellery. All members of the party with metal armour will attempt to surround the rats and kill them. These attacking characters move forward 15 feet and the rats move forward 20 feet. Then melee contact occurs. The melee should be conducted using the alternative combat system as it concerns fantastic types, i.e. characters who have more than two hit dice, versus normal types, i.e. the rats, who have less than two hit dice. I'll discuss exactly why this is the case. The mysterious alternative combat system first mentioned in OD&D volume 1 Men and Magic appears to have caused much confusion over the last 50 years especially regarding its connection with the combat rules in its predecessor Chainmail. It appears to me that for these past five decades there has been bit of misinterpretation in regards to utilising the alternative combat system in the way it was initially intended. This is fine, of course. Nobody needs to or even should play the original Dungeons & Dragons game rules as written. In many ways, you cannot, as the rules were supposedly left incomplete um, on purpose to allow for variation and evolution. However, like most things, 
in order to get the best of it, making well-informed decisions in its regard and adequate understanding is a huge boon. What is commonly known about the alternative combat system is supplemented by an article Gary Gygax wrote in Strategic Review Issue 2, which basically was a Dungeons & Dragons FAQ to aid early players of the game with their understanding of certain aspects of the rules. The article shed some light on the intended utilisation of the alternative combat system. It explains that Chainmail is primarily a system for 1 to 20 scale combat, although it provides a basic understanding for man-to-man -man fighting also. The man-to-man -man and fantasy supplement sections of Chainmail provide systems for tabletop actions of small size. The regular Chainmail system is for larger actions where man-like types are mainly involved, i.e. kobolds, goblins, dwarves, orcs, elves, men, hobgoblins, etc. It is suggested that the alternative system in D&D be used to resolve the important melees where principal figures are concerned, as well as those involving the stronger monsters. When fantastic combat is taking place, there is normally only one exchange of attacks per round, and unless the rules state otherwise, a six-sided die is used to determine how many hit points damage is sustained when an attack succeeds. Weapon type is not considered, save where magical weapons are concerned. A superhero, for example, would attack eight times only if he were fighting normal men, or creatures basically that strength, i.e. kobolds, goblins, gnomes, dwarves, and so on. These paragraphs of text imply that depending on the situation, different methods of combat resolution should be used. We have the man to man system in chainmail, the regular chainmail 120 scale system for large actions where man like types are mainly involved. Finally, the alternative combat system for melees with principal figures and stronger monsters, i.e. fantastic combat. To add some clarity regarding when these three systems should be used, we need to understand some common terminology used throughout the OD&D lifespan. Manlike types, which are also often referred to as normal types, means figures of less than two hit dice, i.e. figures who are not classed as being equivalent to more than a single person in their fighting capability. Principal figures and stronger monsters are often referred to as fantastic types, which means figures of more than two hit dice, i.e. figures who are equivalent to more than a single person in their fighting capability. Once we understand these simple definitions, we can much more easily make sense of the various OD&D combat systems and when they should be applied. Now, there is a bit of confusion over what it means in OD&D when we talk about fantastic combat. Some people presume that fantastic combat, which is when creatures of more than two hit die are fighting, should be conducted on the fantasy combat table in Chainmail. But actually, this is when the alternative combat system should be used. That is, the attack matrices that were given in Men and Magic. These attack matrices were not supposed to replace the man-to-man -man system in Chainmail. They were supposed to replace the fantasy combat table so that it encompasses all monsters and characters. Let's look at the passage in Strategic Review Issue 2 again, which says, It is suggested that the alternative system in D&D be used to resolve the important melees where principal figures are concerned, as well as those involving the stronger monsters. Further, in the typewritten draft of od and it says, fantasy versus fantasy, because of the vast numbers of fantastic creatures and levels of men, a matrix to show hits is totally impractical. We know because we tried. 
but with 70 or more categories, it becomes too unwieldy to handle. We therefore recommend that a system utilising a 20-sided die with increments of 5% be adopted. The draft then goes on to provide the attack matrix. The draft also explains that if normal types are fighting fantastic types, then the 1 to 20 scale combat table should be used, with the normal types scoring 1 hit point when they hit, and the stronger creatures scoring hits equal to a die roll, 1 to 6. Another term that is sometimes dropped into the various OD&D scriptures is supernormal types, and this basically means figures who can advance upwards in levels, i.e. player characters. These could also be considered as principal figures and therefore could be also considered as fantastic types. But I think this is open to discussion. Perhaps they are fantastic types when they achieve a fighting capability of two or more hit dice. So everything I've just said can be faithfully boiled down to the following guidelines for deciding which combat systems to use. So if you have normal types versus normal types, small numbers of creatures of less than two hit dice, normal types, fighting, it will be most interesting to use the man-to-man -man melee table. If large numbers of creatures of less than two hit dice are fighting, the combat tables based on a troop ratio of one to 20 should be used. When we have normal types versus fantastic types, so creatures of less than two hit dice, normal types, fighting creatures of more than two hit dice, fantastic types, then the 120 combat tables should be used if we have fantastic types versus fantastic types. So creatures of more than two hit dice, fighting creatures of more than two hit dice, fantastic types. Use the alternative combat system attack matrices. So if you found this discussion interesting, and want to read everything I just covered at your leisure, then visit my blog at solodungeoncrawler.blogspot.com as I post articles on there to record these types of discussions. So back to the encounter. The party have the initiative and space allows six characters to attack. As the rats are armor class 8, the characters will need 11s to hit, as all attacking are under the uh, third level currently. They manage to score 3 hits, but no kills. All 6 characters can make a second attack, as they have 2 hit die versus the rats single hit die. They score 4 hits and this time they manage three kills. Brother Bart gets a third attack as he has three hit down, but he misses. The rats make their return blows, needing at least 16s to have any chance of scoring a hit. They score just one hit against Drago, who is reduced from 10 to eight hit points. There is a 5% chance that he will catch a disease from the bite. He does not. So I adopted this rule from the AD&D monster manual, as there is actually not much information on the giant rat prior to this. It's largely left up to the campaign referee to determine uh, exact behaviours. So... My referee in this instance was Gary himself. The party win the initiative again on the second round. They quickly score two hits and two kills. The fight is done. On the next turn, as the questing knights are making their way back to the stone pedestal with the offertory box, they encounter the gelatinous cube once again, coming straight towards them. They decide to flee back into the now cleared out rat's nest and head northeast from there. The evasion 
is a success. The questing knights are soon surprised from behind and ahead by six burglars, three on each side. I'll briefly cover now how this was determined. It's a bit like the world's simplest monster AI. I've come across some examples of solo TTRPG enthusiasts attempting to create what they sometimes call a monster AI, which is designed to determine the behaviours of monsters when encountered in a game of solo D&D or the like. It got me thinking about OD&D and how, in those earliest rulebooks, monster behaviour is already, albeit in a very simple way, codified to some extent. To begin with are some basics to set up a typical wandering monster encounter. Typically, the circumstances of the encounter are determined as follows. A role for surprise is made, and to quote Underworld and Wilderness Adventures, a condition of surprise can only exist when one or both parties are unaware of the presence of the other. Such things as ESPing, light and noise will negate surprise, and if the possibility for surprise exists, roll a six-sided die for each party concerned. A roll of one or two indicates the party is surprised. Distance is then 10 to 30 feet. If there is no surprise, then players will see monsters at 20 to 80 feet. So here we already have procedural generated some circumstances regarding the encounter. The Underworld and Wilderness Adventures book then goes on to describe the behaviour of the monsters. If monsters gain surprise, they will either close the distance between themselves and the characters, unless they are intelligent and their prey is obviously too strong to attack, or attack. We are also provided with a good example. A wyvern surprises a party of four characters when they round a corner into a large open area. It attacks as it is within striking distance, as indicated by the surprise distance determination, which was a two, indicating distance between them was but ten feet. The referee rolls a pair of six-sided dice for the wyvern and scores a six, so it will not sting, it bites and hits. The wyvern may attack once again before the adventurers strike back. You'll notice that dice are used to determine whether the wyvern will bite or sting. This sets a precedent that if a monster has multiple attacks, then a die roll can be used to determine which attack is used. The book also tells us that monsters will automatically attack and or pursue any characters they see, with the exception of those monsters which are intelligent enough to avoid an obviously superior force. And the more intelligent monsters will act randomly according to the results of the score rolled on two six-sided dice. This is referring to the famous reaction rolls which have been prevalent in all old-school editions of D&D. The book even tells us that the direction of appearance is determined by random number generation, considering the number of possible entries. So as you can see, there is plenty of default behaviour cooked into the game that are ideal for solo play. We are also given a useful guide for determining the exact number of monsters involved in the encounter. If the level beneath the surface roughly corresponds with the level of the monster, then the number of monsters will be based on a single creature modified by type. That is, orcs and the like will be in groups, and the number of adventurers in the party. A party of from 1 to 3 would draw the basic number of monsters, 4 to 6 would bring about twice as many, and so on. The bit about deciding whether the monster is a single creature, or the type that typically moves in groups, is a bit ambiguous. However, there is an easy way to determine this. If you take a look at the monster level tables in Greyhawk, 
which was included as a correction to the original monster level tables. Each table has a list of monsters and you will note that some of these monsters are written as plurals and some singular. I believe this is done to tell the referee which monsters should be alone and which in a group. So in summary, we can say the following behaviours are the default. If nobody or both sides gain surprise, then monsters will automatically attack or chase, pursue any characters they see, unless the monsters are smart enough to avoid a clearly stronger opponent. If the party is surprised and the monsters are not, then Unintelligent monsters, or those with a stronger force, will close in on the characters, or attack if they are already within 10 feet. If intelligent monsters do not have the stronger force, they will act based on a role from the Random Actions by Monsters table in D&D Volume 3. All this being said, there is still many gaps to fill if you want a workable procedure for handling monster behaviour in a solo game. However, it is quite easy to build on the information already given, and there are also additional clues throughout the rules that might be utilised, such as wilderness monsters who gain surprise, who encircle the party. This could be adopted if space allows into the underworld, as is implied by the following text regarding underworld encounters. There can be places where 300 hobgoblins dwell, but how many can come abreast down a typical passage in the dungeons? Allow perhaps three in a 10 foot wide passage, and the balance will either be behind the front rank or fanning out to come upon the enemy by other routes. The most fearsome man or monster can be overwhelmed by sheer numbers of smaller, weaker creatures, provided the latter are able to close. We might also surmise that monsters can approach from any of the following random directions, either behind or ahead, and depending on the monster's skills it could be on the ground, ceiling or walls. There are also circumstances when it might approach from a flanking position if the space allows for it. The burglars throw an uncertain reaction roll. Ilara uses their hesitation to enter negotiations with them. They roll positive this time. She requests directions. The burglars explain a portion of the map to Ilara and indicate where a room is which houses several pit traps that drop characters into a pool with a giant eel place perhaps that is best to be avoided. So basically the way this works in my game is that when a monster rolls a positive reaction roll, the solo player may choose the outcome. I have a list of several things the player can choose from and this includes receiving directions, receiving a bribe, a quest, exchanging prisoners or luring the monster into service. Each option has its own associated mechanics. I've stuck an article on my blog which provides specific details. To access the articles associated with each episode of this podcast, visit solodungeoncrawler.blogspot.com and under labels, choose the correct episode number. This just makes it a bit easier to find what you're looking for. So a few turns later, the questing knights break into a room and are immediately confronted by two footpads who are in the middle of gathering a small treasure hoard, but are not surprised by the party's sudden entrance. The distance of the encounter is 10 feet, so melee contact has already occurred. For this encounter, Maud, who is in the second rank and therefore not technically meleeed, wants to cast his sleep spell to avoid violence and so the question arises as to whether he is able to do this before he is attacked. This is where the dexterity adjustments for missile and spell casting detailed in Eldritch Wizardry can come in handy. The text in Eldritch Wizardry says, 
question of when various actions take place during a melee round often arises in order to simply and easily satisfy the problem of when any action can take place the melee round has been further subdivided into pre-movement movement of six segments and post-movement or eight parts in all all melee activities including missile fire spell casting movement and combat then are assigned to some, possibly all part, of the melee turn. So to calculate whether Maud can cast his spell before the footpads, we need to compute both his and their adjusted dexterity rating. The plan may not work, so I give individual written orders to each of my characters involved in the melee, who will attempt melee attacks. Hilda, however, will attempt to get a crossbow shot off before the melee kicks off. Maud's raw dexterity score is 10. As sleep is a level 1 spell, there is no dexterity penalty. However, he gets a minus 2 penalty for being in the second rank. So his adjusted dexterity rating is 8. He can therefore cast his spell on segment 2 of the combat round. As the foot pads do not have a predetermined rating, I roll it on the spot using 3d6. They score a 6. Their leather armour reduces this to 4, so they cannot act until segment 3. Therefore, the sleep spell can be cast before they are able to attack any character. Maud casts sleep on the foot pads. The spell puts all four of them into a deep slumber. The party then search the sleepers for magic items. They have a 10% chance for each applicable category. So after making the necessary rolls, the loot results in a sword plus one or plus three versus dragons and another sword plus one or plus three versus trolls or clerics, a ring of three wishes and some oil of etherealness. It may seem strange to you that footpads would be so undexterous. You're probably right, but OD&D does not supply any dexterity scores for monsters. Gary did include some suggestions in an early version of Keep on the Borderlands, but nothing is given for character type monsters. The first ever Dungeons & Dragons basic set known as Holmes Basic, which is actually a re-edit of original D&D, but for character levels one to three, instructs the referee to roll monster dexterity scores on the spot. So it kind of makes sense to do this. It's tempting to pull in a whole bunch of dexterity adjustment tables to handle the various types of character classes, but I don't think this is necessary. There is nothing unrealistic in my opinion to having lousy thieves who aren't as dexterous as might be. Mostly the bell curve probabilities of 3d6 will make most thieves of average dexterity. Only some will be good at it, and some others very poor. Their numbers ensure they survive long enough to gain some advancement, but faced with a group of adventurers in the underworld armed with the knowledge of a sleep spell, well, you've just heard what can happen. It's just lucky for them they survived the encounter, presuming of course that the gelatinous cube does not come over this way while they are trapped in a deep slumber. With the magic item secured, the party decide it's time to leave. But, as the party are making their way out of the dungeon, they can hear a scuttling ahead of them, filling their retainer, the dwarven thief Carson, with terror. With a morale check of only five, he is apprehensive, and so falls back 30 feet, costing the party precious time. He is also now towards the back of the party's marching order. As the party emerge from a passage into a larger chamber, 
they are surprised to find themselves encircled by a large group of bird-like monsters, Sturges. The Sturges gain three attacks against the party and manage to kill both Ascalante and Carson. In the first round of combat, the Sturges also kill Viridis and Bree, and Maud, who is still having his blood sucked from the last round, also succumbs. Ilara will attempt to cast a Phantasmal Forces spell and scare the Sturges into retreat. With her adjusted dexterity rating, she can cast this spell in a single segment. She projects the mental image of a large red dragon charging into the chamber, ready to breathe fire on anyone in sight. The Sturges need a 16 to save as the spells. Only two save. I will now make a morale check for the Sturges to see if the last two also flee the combat. They need an eight to remain. They will continue to fight. Bart, Hilda, Drago and Galantia can make attacks. They need 12s to hit. They score five hits and make two kills. The battle is over. With only five party members alive, they will need to get out of the dungeon, possibly taking the corpses of their friends with them. Six corpses weigh 1,750 encumbrance each, totaling 10,500. Total equipment which is being carried is 6,991. Total encumbrance is therefore 17,491. And the maximum load for each person at half movement is 3,000. Divided by five, there is an excess of about 500 encumbrance each. The party need to get rid of 2,491 encumbrance. By stripping armor and weapons from the corpses, they can free up 2,010, but 481 still remains. The party drop another six daggers and all basic equipment is stripped from the corpses Ilara drops a spare dagger, and finally, Bart drops his sling. The party can now move at 60 feet per turn, and hopefully make it out alive. As the party are dragging their friends' bodies and the treasure up a corridor, no less than six spiders come scuttling up from behind along the right wall. The spiders use their surprise advantage to close the distance to 10 feet. This is an interesting encounter as far as delving into OD&D rules is concerned, as I get to use the 1 to 20 scale combat, where one figure represents 20. Why is this the case? Well, in combat between normal types and fantastic types, which is creatures of less than 2 hit dice, normal types, fighting creatures of more than 2 hit dice, fantastic types, then the 1 to 20 combat tables from Chainmail should be used, with the less than two hit dice creatures scoring one hit point when they hit and the stronger creatures scoring hits equal to die roll one to six. We can consider the party's meleeing characters as a single unit of combatants. So the first thing we need to determine is what classification they are. Light foot, heavy foot, armored foot and so on. As the unit is intermixed with various armor class ratings we can add up the armor class of every creature who is opposed in the melee and divide by the number of creatures rounding up to determine what type they will defend as. Only the front rank should be taken into account when doing this. So AC between 9 and 6 can be considered light foot, 5 or 4 would be heavy foot and 3 or 2 armored foot. The spiders fight as light foot and the party as armoured foot. Spiders get two rolls with sixes scoring hits. They score no hits. The meleeing members of the party get 11 hits with 46 killing. They kill four spiders. The spiders need an eight to remain. They scuttle away.
As the party are making their way north along a ten foot wide passage, they can hear a group of humans crossing a room ahead, beyond a broken door. Both parties are aware of each other. At this point, the party have been on this delve for more than four hours. They have no torches, but are burning an oil lantern for which they have five flasks of oil left. They have also passed in excess of an hour without rest, so are currently fatigued. Um, and this is how I handle character fatigue. If adequate rest is not taken, then characters become fatigued and suffer the following penalties. Minus one to attack rolls, minus one to armor class, minus one to dice rolls on morale checks for NPCs only. One turn of non-movement fully restores fatigue. And these penalties are based on the ones given in chainmail, which apply at 120 scale. So if combat is at 120, then the chainmail penalties apply as follows. The characters attack at the next lower level, e.g. heavy foot becomes light foot. They defend at the next lower level and morale value drops for NPCs. So, minus one on values and die or dice rolls. And in regards to resting, if a wandering monster check indicates a monster during the party's rest, and any monsters are known to be in any directly adjacent rooms, then the monster or monsters will be from one of these rooms. When resting in rooms, secured doors such as those secured with spikes or spells, such as whole portal or wizard lock, will negate any chance of a wandering monster. When spiking doors shut, there is a two in six chance a single spike will slip. 10 spikes must be used to reduce the chance to one in six, and no less than 20 spikes to negate the possibility altogether. The party win the initiative and will attempt to bribe the humans with their platinum ring worth 6,000 gold pieces. The reaction roll is positive and the ring is exchanged for directions and covering more undiscovered portions of the map. Five turns of movement later, as the party are turning into a 20 foot wide passage leading east, a group of bugbears are turning into the same passage from an intersecting one to the north. The party win the initiative They've been really lucky with initiative rolls today. Drago and Hilda will move to the front of the party and fire crossbows on the approaching bugbears. They of course suffer penalties for fatigue and they both miss. Bart begins to cast Cure Light Wounds on Ilara who has taken some damage thus far. Ilara begins to cast Charm Person on one of the bugbears, the spells take effect. Alara will be healed for five hit points in one round of time. The targeted bugbear fails its save and is charmed. The other bugbears reach the party and begin to melee. Only five will melee as the other is charmed. The melee is four versus five as Alara will stay out of it. The party get the first strike. Hilda gets a plus two to hit for her high strength, but also has the penalty for her fatigue. Four hits are scored, resulting in just one kill. The bugbears get their return blows now, but even with the party's defensive penalties, the bugbears all miss. On the second round, the, the party go first. The party do not want to risk their luck running out, so they offer the bugbears a potion and jewellery to let them pass. And this is equivalent to 3,400 gold pieces. The negotiation is a success. The party spend the following turn at rest. And about eight turns later, they manage to navigate out of the dungeon, so ending another adventure. And that's all I have time for on this occasion. I 
sincerely hope you enjoyed the journey today and hopefully found the OD&D discussion interesting enough. Have a great week. See you next session.